Well, let's kick it off, though, since all of you are here. So our session this afternoon, welcome, starts with the assumption that leadership matters. Leaders establish vision and inspiration for achieving organizational goals. Today, we're going to have a forum focused on leadership, and we're going to look at it from a number of different organizational levels. In, in those of us putting this panel together were thinking, isn't it interesting to think about having someone who's relatively new to the field, someone who's on staff, someone who's a department level manager, and me representing from, if you were in my morning session, the sociopath level, like the <laughs> executive leadership level, and thinking a little bit about, um, so first of all, none of us are gonna proclaim that we know everything there is to know about this, okay? What we do well, and we're all avid students of this topic, what we do well is we hold things up to the light and we examine these things and we say, hmm, that's interesting. What do you think? So we're gonna bounce some ideas around, shed light on some things, explore some topics. If you have something to say, raise your hand or shout it out because we're here to be with you in this community. We're not here to deliver a lecture. We have some topics we're gonna cover. If you have thoughts on those topics, please jump in. You may know more than we do about it. But before that, let's do some introductions. My name is Douglas Hegley. I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Minneapolis Institute of Art. I have, um, that's a large art museum in the Twin Cities, which is not frozen all year long, as many of you may suspect. Um, we have about 90,000 objects, 250-ish staff, $33 million operating budget. I've been there for a little over six years. I've been in the museum sector for more than 20 years and in nonprofit since the Stone Age. Um, my job in many ways is finding the best people and turning them loose and getting them to be successful in, in ways that are possible and you know, perhaps not allowing the elephant in the room to go unnoticed. I'm Claire Blackman. I'm the Digital Asset Manager at the PBD Essex Museum in Salem. We are a very old institution founded in 1799 by ship's captains. And so we are, we're pretty big. I don't know if we'd say we're like top level, but we are a pretty big institution. Um, those of you who saw my Ignite also know that I'm an organizer in the activist sense. So I organize our museum's cultural responsibility coalition, which is the first time I've said that in public. So <laughs> welcome everybody. Um, I don't have any direct reports, but I do a lot of project management. Right now I'm managing the implementation of our first digital asset management system. Megan. Hi, I'm Megan Tung and I'm the digital program manager at MIA. So I work closely with Douglas and I've been thankful to have his uh, support and guidance as I grow at the, as a leader at the museum. Um, been at MIA for over four years now. And I lead a small department and a few cross-functional teams that uh, we're really working to facilitate continuous improvement in our digital projects, and that could be anything from CRM business systems to digital storytelling platforms. Um, sometimes I feel like that's a little bit like Tetris, that we're trying to manage all these moving pieces and keep teams aligned. Uh, and also, I'm a certified Scrum Master, for any of you who are familiar with Scrum, and a great and avid lover of post-it notes, which I have right here at all times. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Ledesma, the Digital Content Coordinator at the Field Museum in Chicago. We're one of the largest natural history museums in the US and you probably know us for our star dino to sue the T-Rex. Uh, I'm an emerging museum professional. I just joined the museum in September, uh, but I've worked in the past in positions in public history, instructional design, and the digital humanities. Um, so yeah, my position is new. Uh, I don't manage anyone. I get managed and work through departments, uh, supporting the development of various digital projects, which right now means the redesign of our website. And yeah, if I had to characterize my leadership style now, it'd be three parts Ravenclaw, one part Hufflepuff, with a lot <laughs> of post-it notes like Megan. <laughs> <laughs> and 3M is headquartered in Minnesota, so thank you yeah. for your post-it note <laughs> thank you. patronage. Is this the sponsor of this panel? <laughs> it should be, right? Definitely should be. Um, so what's going to happen for the session now, I'm going to try to set context two or three times and then turn to the panelists and get some of their perspectives on that context. I'm going to start with talking first a little bit just about leadership, right? So ideally, the model is that leaders start with inspiration. They start with a vision. They start with a sort of where can we be. Your strategy is the kind of road that you'll take to get there. And in an organization that's working well, the tactics or the things that the staff do align perfectly with those two elements and it all sings in harmony. How many of you have that going on perfectly in your organization? <laughs> Didn't think so. Well, let's see if we can work on that a little bit. Let's talk a little bit first about optimal leadership. So 
many phenomena in the natural world have this sort of stimulus response U-shape, inverted U-shape curve, right? So if you have absolutely no leadership involvement, you're being ignored, your productivity is pretty low. But at the other end of the spectrum, when your leader is all over you all the time, productivity also drops down. Somewhere in between there is a sweet spot where a leader is involved enough and understands enough about what's going on, but can be empowering, encouraging, help you with prioritization, but allow you to do your work. And in that moment is where you find highest levels of productivity in the staff because we don't make widgets, right? We work, we're knowledge workers. We work with information. So I'm going to turn to the panelists now and say, from your perspectives, leadership role. Megan, did you want to start with this? Okay. Hi. So uh, Cy Wakeman is a, a recent addition to my leadership studies. Uh, we recently saw her speak at a conference, and uh, it was really illuminating to think about, for me, how leadership is about creating a supportive environment for growth. And uh, this is really illustrated in Sai's work of reality-based leadership. And she has a couple books that you could check out. Um, but really, she's suggesting that leader's new role is to help employees eliminate emotional waste. And that's what she defines as drama. And by facilitating good mental processes. And so the key, really, for leaders is to coach their teams towards self-reflection and high accountability, and that all the other things sort of fall away. Um, so I've been really encouraged by that model. And I'd encourage you to check it out. Claire, I think you had a couple thoughts too, yes? Uh, yeah, so this summer, uh, the editor and I did a week at the Yale University Publishing course, which is a uh, week-long course run out of the business school for mid-level professionals about leadership in the book publishing industry. And for me, leadership has a lot to do with decision-making. You need, you need someone to decide on something. Otherwise, you are just going to talk around and get nowhere eventually. So. Uh, one big thing we did there was this thing called Decision Making for Leaders, DMFL, which there's, there's a lot going on here, and I will just kind of breeze through it quickly. Uh, basically, what happened was they gave us scenarios, like three paragraph things in which they described a scenario in which a leadership decision needed to be made, and then you answered on a spectrum of these five strategies of how you would personally come to that decision. Like, would you? This is kind of also like the spectrum. Would you just, just decide unilaterally? Would you consult people individually? Would you consult with a group? Would you facilitate, which is to say that when you, you go to the group and you act as kind of the facilitator to kind of have them come to a decision together within your facilitation? Or if you delegate, which is just like leave yourself out of it and be like, guys, you go and solve that as well. So what happens is they gave these same scenarios to thousands of business executives and business school people. And just over like decades, they've done this. And they've come to kind of a general model of who decides in what ways, under what situations. So what they do is they give you, and I have examples of these later if people want to practice. Uh, they say to you, OK, here's how you, as a person, tend to decide, make decisions under these kinds of circumstances. And they give you a giant like report at the end. It's all like, oh, your analysis. And there's charts, and it's slopes, and there's math, and it's crazy. But the idea is not to be like, you decide things incorrectly. It's to be uh, cognizant of how you make decisions in different situations, and to be like, well, how is that relate or not relate to how successful executives do as well? So it ends up with this flow chart over here where you go from the left to the right and you say, well, if it's a high significance, but it's important that people buy into it, but if people are knowledgeable, and then you go through, you kind of can use that as a matrix for deciding. And there's two different ways to do either like time-driven model when, let's be honest, sometimes you don't have a lot of time. And there's a development-driven model, which fits better on the slide is why we have it. <laughs> and that's for if you want to do more of that developing of your staff. So that's decision making. So the role of a leader, um, Megan, you talk about sort of taking out the drama, moving toward a more sort of feet on the ground mature way of approaching decision making. Claire, a framework for making decisions. Andrea, I know we don't have a slide, but <laughs> role of a leader for someone who's relatively new in the field. Role of a leader as me acting as leader or what I look up to? Hmm. Either way. Yeah. No, I think. The nugget that I had for this in my head is that 
you know, they're not necessarily, you're not always going to have a manager position, but you're always in a position to lead. Um, this notion that Cy Wakeman, you mentioned, of like fostering environments for growth. At this point in my career, I think leadership definitely comes with it from within and finding those opportunities either in an institution or in your personal life that will allow you to take that moment for growth and put it in the context of an institution you believe in, but also in the service of a public that you'd like to support. So I think it's finding um, that conversation and opening up those lines. Excellent. Any comments from the floor about the role of a leader? Everyone hanging in there last hour of the day? <laughs> Good, all right. I want to talk a little bit about um, servant leadership, although Recently, I've seen this evolve into the concept of host leadership. So, and I think we'll, we'll riff on servant leadership a little bit as we move on. The role, and, and this is where decision making gets really interesting in a way. Because I understand the matrix, I understand the importance of making good decisions and, and, and making sure that, that it's clear why you're making them that way. My preference as a leader is that I make very few decisions. Now, that may sound kind of counterproductive, but the idea is I guess the decision I make is to be the host. And what does a host do? A host sort of sets up the environment, right? I create this event or the decision or business process. I invite the guests in. This is the staff. This is the talent that works in the museum. Create a space and kind of define a few of the ground rules to make sure that it's clear what we're up to and how we're going to work on it. Work on building connections and strengthening the team, right? The guests who are there at the table. So that, and then I'm, you know, as a host, I'm co-participating in the process. If you're having a great dinner party, you don't sit back silently, right? You're actually there and you're with the people who are there with you. Then I also think a lot about more responsibilities in that model. The idea is that I work with people. I don't manage resources. Hmm. If I were managing resources, I would be operating some sort of pump that fuel came out of, right? And I don't see people in that way. I believe in radical autonomy. I'm not really interested in power. I'm interested in the museum being successful. And I understand that my position depends on success in the museum. My position depends on the success of the staff. And if I act like that person on the screen, that won't happen. I have to listen. I have to make sure to clear obstacles, appreciate, give credit. You have to give credit sincerely. You've probably heard those sort of smarmy bosses who give credit to everybody, even the ones who didn't participate in the project, and it just <laughs> feels like they weren't even paying attention, and ultimately they're just trying to make themselves look good. So you give credit, but you do it in a very sincere and meaningful way. And then those executive torpedoes. How many of you have worked really hard on a project with a team, been moving along the road, you're almost done, your deadline's coming up, you feel really good about it, and someone from the executive suite shoots that torpedo, comes in, changes the scope, changes the timeline, changes the deliverable. Anyone ever experienced that? We call it the swoop and poop. There you go. <laughs> Le maybe less explosive, but more gross. <laughs> so I think my job is to kind of be the sonar, right? I don't need to be hovering over the team. Are you doing your work? Are you getting it done? What's going on? I need to be the sonar out there watching out for those executive torpedoes and making sure that I can st I'm the one who blocks those and that they don't undermine the team. But as we were talking a little bit about servant or host leadership, you guys had some really interesting perspectives on it. Yeah, I'd just like to add a note that you know the servant leader from the actual Servant Leadership Institute, how they define this is servant leader shares power, puts the needs of others first, and helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. Servant leadership turns the power pyramid upside down. Instead of the people working to serve the leader, the leader exists to serve the people. It sounds great, and I think uh, in concept that's really powerful. But in a field that's dominated by, but rarely led by women, uh, this could be problematic. Uh, it's an opportunity to find leadership in a new way, but it's also could be simply gender bias at play, where we're thinking about reinforcing the idea that women are here to serve. So I just kind of want to throw that question out there and offer a counterpoint that servant leadership could have a different lens to it. Yeah, um, hearing that, it reminded me of a bus read I had for a little while. Uh, Tim, Tiffany Dufu's dropped the ball, and her main conceit here is that women achieve less, or achieve more, more, uh, by doing less. And it's, the notion is just to rethink your priorities, right? If that notion of tending and conflating your responsibilities at home and in the office is incredibly destructive, 
Um, that notion of the woman having it all, it's like be realistic about your priorities. You don't want to be split into like twos or threes or fours. And she has this really great quote, um, what would happen if we all started speaking honestly about our priorities and the choices we make? Women need to support each other by being honest. So just acknowledging that success is messy and things fall through the cracks and you have to live with that for a little while and find value in it. And I think to achieve greater gender equity in our leadership, we really need to acknowledge this imbalance and address it. And uh, Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant had a really great piece in the New York Times a couple years back about women doing the office housework. So that's really the administrative tasks that uh, nobody else would necessarily pick up, just like that often happens at home too. Um, so thinking about these tasks that really help and are crucial to business, but don't necessarily pay off in terms of career development. So, um, you know, that person taking diligent notes in a meeting likely will not have the opportunity to make a killer point. And we just wanted to acknowledge, too, that um, we could devote an entire panel on the relationship between gender and leadership. It's a huge and important line of dialogue in this conversation. Dialogue and conversation. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a point of conflict, though, as well, as men and women are navigating various obstacles and challenges as they move their way up through an organization. Um, immediately coming to mind are like a the AMD study uh, in 2017 that looked at the incremental gains of women in leadership in art museums, and how it varied across capacities of institutions and salaries and whatnot. And even yesterday in the mentorship panel, there was a call for women mentors for the MCN community. So if you're thinking about it, please apply. Uh, and the question that I just have constantly thinking about this is, what are the leadership models that best empower women? And really thinking about it another way, what are leadership models that would prevent us from reinscribing the gender roles that are problematic and oppressive and misogynistic? Thoughts from the floor? <laughs> He says as the senior guy with three women standing on the, at the podium. standing <laughs> in a suit jacket. So uh, you mentioned the kind of standing between executive decisions uh, issue uh, opportunity at, in the leadership. And I think uh, this is sometimes it's a very gender thing as well. So it kind of connects where uh, managers stand in, in between these decisions so often that it burns them out. I've had both uh, uh, executive and director roles above me burn out because they were taking all of the, the problems uh, that were coming down the chain instead of allowing the kind of collective group to, to work out the, the challenges and stress that comes from that. So I'm wondering like how you approach that balance of like being a filter but not also being a it, it's a great question, and I'm going to lead my answer on that and then ask you guys about it too, with just the concept of radical transparency. So the fact that I will, because I'm not trying to protect anybody, protecting is paternalistic and condescending. So I, it's not like I'm going and taking the slings and arrows and pretending to everyone else that it's not happening. Right? When, I, when my sonar goes off and I'm like, here comes a torpedo, hey everyone, here comes a torpedo, I'm going to go take care of it, oh crap, I need some help, who can help, right? So it's not some kind of superhero complex, it's more like my responsibility is to watch out for those. Not necessarily to take all the emotional baggage that comes along with that kind of stuff. But I think it's also my responsibility to disarm the submarines. So my work often is, is, is allowing the team to go do their stuff, I go to the executive level and talk to them about not sending torpedoes and why it feels like a torpedo and why do they think they need to do that and where is it that trust is breaking down that they just think they have to jump in at the last minute and change everything? Communication issues, like there's a lot that's going on there. It's not just standing in front of the bullet, right? That's really not the concept. Did you guys have any other? Thinking about the long form proactive work that we can do to avoid that imbalance, which I mean, I absolutely feel it at, at, as a mid-level manager that I'm kind of in between some of the decisions that are being made on either side. Um, so, so being as proactive and getting ahead of those communication uh, failures or getting ahead of, of what we can do to make that less of a reactive state. Yeah, so it's not to think that those torpedoes will be more unlikely if indeed you keep the executive level involved throughout the process. And that's the mistake that a lot of us do is that we don't involve them throughout the process. Define involved. <laughs> well, you need to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> but to a certain extent, meaning that 
if you get a project and you get like the you know the direction from executive level on the right. project, yeah. you don't wait until you finish it yes. to show it to them again. Yes, absolutely true, absolutely true. And there are certainly, um, I think in an ideal organization, the team that's working to solve the issue is going and talking to the executive sponsor of that issue on a frequent enough basis that the communication is not breaking down. So there's no need for them to come in at the last minute. But all of us know you have a director who's gone for a month traveling at some conference and then some other fundraising thing and then they come back and they, so they tip over the apple cart, right? So there's responsibility at all levels to make sure that that, that, that flow is going on. Did I see another hand somewhere? Yes. Claire, you manage some projects. I do. Does that ever happen to you? Um, well, at my, at my last job, I was called pushy <laughs> for asking for equal pay for equal work. So there was, it, it happens for sure. I will say, first thing, when you were talking about, you do need a timeline and a budget. Like, that's not, <laughs> you can't just not. It's not negotiable. <laughs> and I think what helps me when I do a lot of cross-departmental projects for this is to have a very clearly defined process uh, we do a marketing image process with uh, lots of different stakeholders, the curators, the marketers, the PR people, and we have like a written down, here's how this goes. I will put the images up on the Google set, and then you will comment on them, and then we will have one meeting, and we've worked various iterations of this pro process to make sure that it works for everybody. Um, so I think if everyone knows, okay, here's how we do this kind of thing, then you're not, you're not like stuck with it, but you do have like a framework for how it's gonna go. And people can't be like, oh, I didn't want it to be that way because you know, if you have a problem, then you're working on the process, not on this person like me coming in and who am I to email the director of marketing and be like, you need to come to my meeting. But the meeting's for him, like if the process is for him. So I, that would be my recommendation is to refocus it on process instead of people. Good advice. Let, let's move to the role of staff, of the team members. So as we talk in leadership, there's, um, there's a role of a leader, there's a role of staff too. And I'm gonna jump back to host leadership here and talk about, you know, those of you who are not managers or senior managers, you have some responsibilities too, right? It's to, to accept that invitation, to, to be present, to bring your best self, to assume positive intentions, kind of get a sense of what the house rules are. Um, I, this is one of my favorites, fact with tact, right? Mm -hmm. So there are people who never state fact. They dance around and they flower everything up and you don't know what the hell they're talking about and then it's impossible to know what's, what really is meaning. And then there's the opposite people, right? The grumpy um, emperor's new clothes people, like that's stupid. Like, um, even if it is stupid, <laughs> saying so actually doesn't set up a conversation, it sets up a battle in many ways. So, and then we've talked a little bit about finding agency. And I think we have some thoughts on agency. Will we get to them later or do you wanna talk a little bit about them now? We can do either, but yeah. Okay. Anyone else have thoughts on role of staff? No thoughts whatsoever at four. Yes? I mean, I think it depends a little bit on kind of the trust environment in the, in the institution. And, and, and also, for just sort of earlier, like how scalable these kinds of, because we're talking about a lot of sort of positive um, developments and do these kind of reinforce themselves? Do these sort of bring in others and sort of positivity, or are they kind of buttresses against sort of the, this negative person and that negative yeah. person? So I think it's if trust sort of scales down, different levels of people will be will want to participate, and it's sort of getting like enough positive feedback that people think it's worthwhile 
doing some kind of shutting down and um, not thinking that it's they, they don't want to get heartbroken by like seizing an opportunity only to find right. that it gets our foot be there. Right. Well, and I think one place that a, a team member kind of can be an advocate in that way and be a leader is to help recognize other strengths and support those strengths. And so if everyone is kind of on the same understanding that we're on this together and that we can practice this exercise with each other, then it's not just the leader showing the way, it's actually the entire team who's accountable to that. What do you mean the leader recognizing strengths in the... No, I think the team, like recognizing strengths in each other and really, and saying that we're all responsible for this, we're all accountable for the work that we're doing and it's not just the leader recognizing it. Well, there's a, there's a lot of, and, and, and some of it will come later, and some of it deserves a session of its own, right? Um, one of the rules of thumb, I mean, if a meeting has more than five people in it, it probably shouldn't be a decision-making meeting. It's an update <laughs> meeting. It's information sharing. There's a bunch of people, stakeholders come in, tell them what's going on, get out of the room, right? So we, we sort of have this joke that a team is a two-pizza unit. <laughs> Right? If you can feed your team with two pizzas, that's a team. If you need more than two pizzas, it becomes a party and it accomplishes less and is less effective. So keeping the team tight, making sure the team is communicating frequently with all of its stakeholders is really, really important. Um, so that's one way to sort of frame it. Uh, and I think there are a number of formal frameworks out there for creating your meeting structure and saying, what's the purpose of this meeting? Who are we inviting? Why are they being invited? What are we going to accomplish in this meeting? And when do we stop? And I think we, we're meeting culture, right? We, we try not to be, but we are. And if the meeting's set for an hour, guess how long it lasts? Yeah. It lasts 60 minutes, usually 61, right? It's, we can't help ourselves, but uh, is Scott Sayer in the room? No? Uh, Scott tweeted out like a year ago, rules for meetings at the Corning Museum of Glass. It's worth looking those up. And like they post them up in their conference room and it says some of those things. Um, I'm going to shift to a, another sort of discussion because we have limited time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about leadership models because we're touching on that too. Um, so this is a traditional organizational management model at the Minneapolis Institute of Art where we are actively trying not to be a traditional organization. But guess what? We still have one of these. And the question I have for you is, what's the difference? I mean, really, seriously, what's the difference here? And is that really <laughs> what we're aiming for as an industry? And you know, there's another way of conceptualizing it. Um, slide from this morning, notwithstanding. But you have you know, this sort of general pyramid structure that all of us recognize. And frankly, how is it any different from that? <laughs> and, I don't know about you, but I'm just not interested in working in a structure that's 3,000 years old. It's just not really feeling like it's resonating with me. The structures that we have in place, the way that we think of leadership is ancient, and we need to think of it very, very differently. Panelists, what kind of structure do you have at your organization, and what are the pros and cons of that? Andrew, you have a slide. I do. We'll it's not a slide. chart. I decided to give us a break. This is Stanley Field Hall. You can see the elephants and Sue in the back. Um, that is not our org chart. Uh, our org chart is very similar to Mia's in a way, that sort of ladder. So for context, I am on the web team, which is in uh, the communications department, which is comprised of like PR and marketing, and then we report to the CMO. It's this whole ladder. As someone who just joined, I will say those are incredibly helpful for trying to figure out where to go, for who, and how work goes, and that's about it, just like on an eight and a half by 11 page. Um, we were familiar with the cons, right? It's like a lot of miscommunication, a lot of frustration, because then it's like, but wait, such and such is also in charge of this. But I think for, I guess the pro and the con is finding that gap right between the representation of an institution and the reality of it, which is really interesting to navigate as a staff member, being the one to really like boots on the ground, like let's get this work done. Um, so thinking about 
the org structure in the context of this panel, I was reminded what we're doing for our redesign. There's a lot of stakeholder management when you're redesigning a website because it touches so much, as we all know. So we're taking that org chart and shaking up the boxes and shaking everyone out and reorganizing them into groups that aren't necessarily departments, but like content area groups that make sense to the, how we're thinking of the institution or you know user advocate groups or like people reorganizing people to their specialty and their um, sort of expertise to the project and opening up new lines of communication there. So it's flexible, it's just not, I guess, official in that sense. I like it. Claire, yeah. what's PEM look like? Uh, PEM is pretty hierarchical. We use, we put people in slightly different silos than most places do. Like um, the assistant curators are under exhibitions, research, and publications instead of directly under the main curators, which I think works well for us. But I want to talk about kind of these informal groups that you can make too. I found it very useful. I serve lots of different departments. Like my boss was director of publications, but I serve everybody that needs images in and out. And so I found it very useful to like, I commute with people on the train. And so I know people on the train that I wouldn't like talk to otherwise. The, the shop guy that builds exhibitions, um, people in development that I wouldn't talk to otherwise. Uh, I have this, this cultural responsibility coalition that I put together, and these are people like sharing together across departments. I made a techno force team for a while, so like all of us that had super technical jobs, we would just meet together. And I think that that's a that's a good structure to put. Like even you don't have to be like, oh, I'm only allowed to talk to the person that's on above me on the chart. Like you can mm -hmm. form those connections across departments and in formal and informal ways. So I would Excellent. I would recommend that. Excellent, Megan. Um, Let's talk a little bit about Agile. Now, most people have heard of Agile as a software development approach, but something that Megan and I and others at, the, at MIA have been up to is really thinking about applying the concepts of Agile as a sort of management framework. So with Agile, I think it's really important to figure out what problem we're trying to solve, and it's probably not chairs. <laughs> um, so if you're suddenly having all these stand-ups, but without any additional framework, um, that might not work. So Agile's not the solution to all of our problems, but it does offer some working processes that can really help us identify what those problems are and encourage the communication and transparency that we need to get around them. So in Scrum, a specific Agile framework that, that we use within our software development team and hoping to spread that a, a bit further within our uh, org chart that you saw, <laughs> um, thinking about like there are a few roles, the, the product or initiative owner, the scrum master, the team, and the executive sponsor. So we have some traditional roles there that look different because Agile is a customer focused approach to product development. And so as product comes to the center, the Agile leadership is really largely driven by the product owner. And they bring the vision and they help shape the product through each iteration. So that product owner is a really important leadership role in Scrum, but it's also been a really challenging one to assign. Um, you know, organizations really need to recognize the individuals who have the knowledge and authority and availability to own decision making. And rather than leaving that to lots of committees and cross-functional teams, um, who would be that person that can actually represent that? And I, I, we don't do it well. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for growth there and um, starting to recognize more of our projects as products. And these individuals who can really um, be at that place are likely to be the nodes in kind of these small world networks that we have, these, these cross-functional groups and the person who's in every meeting that you're in, you know <laughs> who these people are. Um, so they're connected to the stakeholders and they're also connected to leadership and they can make those informed decisions. So we just need to let them. It's really, so the, those three <coughs> elements you're talking about, right? Knowledge, availability, authority. and authority to be a sort of initiative owner. That's kind of where we're struggling. Because I think in most of our organizations, if they're hierarchical, availability happens at the sort of mid staff range in some way. Um, knowledge is probably permeating, but authority <laughs> is a tough one, right? I think for a lot of museum senior managers who've achieved their position by being authoritative, by being decisive, by being in charge, and now I'm asking them to say, will you please let that go because there's another staff person who's more available, who has the necessary knowledge, and now just needs a little authority. 
And you know what? You can trust that person. Trust. Because <laughs> Rob, when he's my initiative owner, as soon as he gets wind of something that may ruffle some feathers, he's the initiative owner. He's going to go over to the feathers that may ruffle and let them know that something's happening. There'll be communication back. He'll come back to the team and say, too many feathers ruffled. We need to pivot. And having that responsibility is really, really key. And in this more flatter way of looking at, at, at organizational structures and trying to apply Agile, that initiative owner, we've really found this by trying this methodology, it's really pivotal. And for some initiatives, it's been great. And for others, not so great. <laughs> Thoughts from you guys on this idea? Yes? Yeah, so uh, the product or initiative owner is really responsible for the product. As they come with a vision, they are the ones who are checking in on um, you know, the what. They're just answering all of the questions of what are we trying to create. Uh, the team is working on the how, so they're really figuring out you know, what's the tool stack, uh, what are the things that I'm going to use to deliver this product. Um, the team's working closely and doing those daily stand-ups. They're uh, checking in frequently. They're communicating with the product owner on a regular basis. The Scrum Master, so someone like me, is there to support the team and also coach the product owner so that all of those conversations happen smoothly um, and really to own the process, so making sure that the process is going well. Uh, and then the executive sponsor is there so that uh, we have the buy-in that we need from leadership and uh, that we can keep moving. And they always want money. Yeah. <laughs> it's like my kids in college. <laughs> yeah. So utilizing a scrum methodology for management, were you able to leverage any what would more be classified traditional software scrum tools to sort of facilitate any of these processes? Megan's, what, what's worked for us so far? So process comes first, and we've gone through lots of different tools, including Trello, Basecamp. You know, we've kind of touched on all of the traditional ones, um, but this is what works for us. And so we have an analog wall with paper on it and take a snapshot occasionally, but really that's been the most motivating and effective um, is just to keep those notes moving across the wall. And then if I shift it away, so Megan's sort of specifically talking about some of the software development projects that are going on. And we try to shift this away into talking at senior leadership about projects, initiatives. Who are we going to, in essence, um, give responsibility as this initiative owner? And then there's a lot of blank stares, right? Because <laughs> there's worry, there's anxiety that someone's going to make a mistake. One of the things that I found astonishing in our field, I used to work in, in hospitals. Right? I used to work in pediatrics and developmental disabilities. If you make a mistake in a hospital, someone might die. Right? That's a problem. That's why you have multiple <laughs> checks and balances, and that's why every time you go see the doctor, eight people ask you your name and your date of birth. Right? They want to make sure you're the right person so they don't do the wrong procedure. We work in museums. If we make a mistake, someone gets a little mad at us. But no children will die if we make a mistake. No one's life savings will disappear overnight because we made some kind of mistake. And because you're working in Agile, you're working these little iterative steps and you're checking in every single day to make sure you're going on the right track. How big a mistake are you going to make? Right? This is this kind of like anxiety over making anything. Making any kind of mistake kind of blows my mind. I do a lot of reassuring at the executive level around that spirit. You know what? Let's let Ryan go and lead that project. Oh, I don't know about Ryan, you know. He doesn't understand the strategy. Like, give him a shot. He'll come back tomorrow, and you know what? <laughs> Ryan's doing okay. How about the next day? Ryan's still doing okay. No babies are dead. Like, everything's pretty good. I always say there's... You're coaching him, right? It's part of Megan's yeah. responsibility, and part of what I challenge Megan to do is to coach those initiative owners. Yeah, but you know that within a short period of time. And like Shimon has left the room, but he was saying, you don't go do this for months and then come back and, right? Then you have a big mistake and you spent a bunch of money.
So the only option is perfection. Well, it's, uh, you're not practicing Agile if it's chaos. If it's not chaos. Go ahead. Do you have a thought? Megan? Yeah, I think I would add, you know, I agree on the front that, like, to do a full transformation of the organization would be amazing because we definitely have departments that are putting their heels in a bit and don't want to be involved at sure. this level. Um, so trying to think, like, how do we adjust and build an Agile system that works within a museum? Um, and we've been practicing this for a few years, so trying to figure out, like, we continue to iterate on the process, too, so it's not just iterating within each of those products, but right. how do we improve our process to, to communicate better? And I think our stumbling point has always been that product owner, and so that's something I'd like to figure out. How do we coach those people that we all know who those people are? Like, they already have um, great responsibility, but do we give them the decision-making power that they deserve? Mm -hmm. Ruth, were you in the back? So A, it takes time, and B, the whole definition of Agile is adjusting. So I think what you're talking about is sort of lowercase a, Agile. It, because there's some methodologies out there, you don't, it's not like there's one book that says step seven. Right? You, you, you make, make sure it works in your organization. Ryan? What? <laughs> wait, wait, first you said things work at the mat. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> totally, you didn't say that, no tweeting. Um, Don't tweet that I said it. Let's, let's talk a little bit about conflict, because I think that's where you're touching on, Jane, is that this isn't perfect, and that it's hard to get it going unless everyone's on board. What I guess I was saying as a counterpoint is like, if you don't at least start, it'll never get there. And I would never expect to magically have it be in place in one day. There will be frustration points. We talked. Um, as a panel a little bit about um, multiple different ways that conflict can occur um, across and within organizations and, uh, and a few of our favorites we sort of put up here. Some of the things that I struggle with is that the conflicts shift and change over time. They're sort of, you think you have it solved and it squeals away and does something else. Or it catches me by surprise. I like to feel like I have my sonar on all the time and yet these things can sometimes catch me by surprise. Guys, thoughts on workplace conflict? I hate it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot of like at where I've been in my career and how I've gotten to this particular point to wear the hat of the emerging museum professional is finding the points of like enough is enough of like where can I try to talk to this individual as you know me being staff and being leader of you know could could, could I do this. That's not working, let's try this. Whose goals are we meeting here? Am I meeting yours? Are we meeting the projects? Or are we meeting the businesses? And not all the times those three are the same. And we talked a little bit about, you know, getting from stuck to forward momentum, which I think is kind of what you're touching on. And, you know, when you've gone off the rails, it's important to sort of first realize it and then start finding ways to, to correct it. So again, we've, with some of these things might be worth an entire session. Um, on their own, but did we, Andrea, did you have more thoughts on this slide? Uh, the question of managing up, is it possible? Yes. I want to say yes. <laughs> um, that notion of agency that you had before, um, my boss, who I don't think is in here, um, always has the comment of, um, we don't always, we're not hiring just for, uh, for, just from the neck down. Like, we want our 
like our team to think, to hold like the project accountable, are we meeting the deadlines and the deliverables, but also hold all of us accountable. Like think about like, are you as a leader doing all that you can? What can we do better? How is this project serving the mission of the institution? How can we do it better? And like, yeah, just keep on being productively critical. And I think that's a lot, a big part of managing up. I like productively critical, <laughs> I like that. Um, we also talked a little bit about some other methods, right, that we all work in mission-based institutions, and when you get into conflict, one of the best things you can do is take one step back and say, wait a minute, why are we, why are we all working here? Why are we all making 40% less than we could if we actually went and got a real job? Because we actually care. And as I've stated uh, a number of times, and I know some of you may think it's ridiculous, but what do we do in museums? What do we do? What's our job? We save lives. <laughs> I believe it. And if you want to argue about it, we can argue about it over drinks tonight, but we save lives because we change the way that people conceptualize themselves as human beings and fit into the world. We reinterpret reality for them in ways that help them connect and be more tolerant and more empathic. We save lives. And that's what we're up to, and that's why we care. And if you can connect on that passion and caring for the mission, you're a big way towards solving conflict that you're having. And this is our slide where we talked about agency again, but the clock is ticking, so unless someone had intensive thoughts. I want to ask these guys a little bit to put them on the spot. I know that predicting the future is all, always a little bit silly, but what could museum leadership look like when, I don't know, we solve some of these problems, when old guys like me go away and <laughs> the whole world's ruled by women? How, how could we have really terrific and interesting leadership? What would it look like? What could it be? I think it could be more mentorship focused mm -hmm. and realizing that you are, we all are all here to support each other and bring each other somewhere together. And that's what I like about working in a museum the most that was not so much in textbook publishing is that everyone is like going in the same direction. I, when I think of the most meaningful interactions I've had with my boss, they're like when I really screwed up something and she was like, okay, what are we gonna, first of all, what are we gonna do about it? Not like, oh my God, Claire, what have you done? <laughs> and, and then, okay, what are we gonna do about it now? And then how are we gonna prevent it in the future? And it was just such a, like a breath of fresh air to be like, oh man, this is like one thing I've done wrong. I don't have to do everything totally perfect all the time. And I know that my boss appreciates me and all the things that I do do right. And I know that when something goes wrong, it'll be, a learning experience. It won't be a, you know, squashing you down kind of thing. So I think there could definitely be more of that. Yeah. I would agree. I mean, you said it, we're not here for the money, we're here for the mission, and we're together in that, so sort of support each other in it. I think a lot about that notion of radical transparency and like generous honesty, we can get so much more done if people just said what they mean. Yeah. And not just about like, <laughs> yeah, uh, like, Recognizing with and tact. yes, with yeah, tact okay. right. yeah. it goes a long way. Uh, with celebrating skill, but also being honest when it's not working, and a leader that recognizes that your uh, your staff are people, and people are not only their work, and helping them also sort of manage that. Yeah, to say this is not working for me yeah. is a real. That's an easy way to make it not personal, and people need to like leave their ego out of it sometimes. Yeah. I think. Yeah, and I think that the whole lens of just kind of community building, that we can accomplish a lot more if we're all on the same team together and that we're uh, moving in that same direction. And that's actually what Scrum comes from, is that it's a, you know, a rugby term that everyone's in a huddle and they're moving in the same direction. So how do we do that together? So we have a few minutes left. I want, it seemed like people have stuff to say and things to ask. I wanted to make sure to leave that time. So now I hope I'm right. Who has stuff to say or things to ask? Yes. Um, so I, I work in a very decentralized organization with lots of different stakeholders, and everyone has a team that direction. And one of the things that we've noticed works really well is facilitation skills. Mm -hmm. When everyone in the room knows how to facilitate themselves and others, uh, the meetings go a lot better. Do you have, like, do your scrum masters do professional facilitation? Um, I, I, Three hours? Other, yeah, Whew. like really intense long term meetings, but it was because both there was a professional facilitator and we knew how to facilitate ourselves. So, like, how does, what are, you, what are your thoughts on facilitation? 
That's one of my professional development goals for the year, so I like that you brought it up. Um, I am the only scrum master at Mia, so I'm sort of an island of trying to figure out what those processes look like. Um, but I, I agree that I think having those longer, more productive meetings are absolutely a benefit of not having to have one-off meetings all the time. And so this meeting culture could actually drain back if we think about how are we doing the most productive conversation in that moment. And that's not even just having the person running the meeting have those facilitation skills, but having everyone in the room understand that there's um, some process to it. Glenn? There's a slide up here with some stuff that we read that's pretty good. Okay. I mean, that's one, one place to start. Um, there's some recommendations. Come on, you guys are smart. I know all of you. You could read all these books in a week if you really wanted to. But, you know, honestly, it kind of depends on what direction you want to go, I think. One of my favorites is this one, um, the elapsed anarchist approach to being a better leader. Anyone here hear of Zingerman's? The deli in, in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Sounds funny, right? They now make a lot of their money actually running leadership seminars. They practice something called open book finance. Every single employee who works there can see the books. Right? They do absolute radical open leadership. And you know what? Their employees are super loyal. Fantastic. It's commonly ranked as one of the best places to work in the United States. The deli. Well, now it's like five different businesses they've, <laughs> they've, they've expanded. And, um, yeah, they make really good sandwiches. That's true. Yeah. There's a, someone, there's a Michigander here. All right. Okay, cool. <laughs> I love that book, but that's because I love how sort of informal and funny and engaging that author is. If you want something more intense, you do something like Simon Sinek, Start With Why. It's much more structured. But any of these books and, the, and where they lead you and the things that they reference. All of these people do TED Talks, watch the TED Talks, whatever, you know, whatever gets you going. Yeah? Oh, I'm really interested in the question of growth and how maybe the person who's at a mid-level manager or is a high-level manager makes a jump to an executive level. What kinds of skills do they need to invest in or how can they claim their leadership role? How, how that goes into the culture? Am I the only one who can answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> God, I wish that there was one path to that, because I, I don't think there is. Um, if I can use myself as a personal example, I, sh I demonstrated consistently that I was willing to take the risks and take the blame if anything ever went wrong, but that I didn't care about the credit. I demonstrated that time and time and time again to senior management. I want to do this new and innovative thing. If it all goes to hell in a handbasket, it's my fault. Throw me under the bus. If it's wildly successful, thank you. Go take credit for it. And it's, after a while, there's just this kind of, you, you, you engender enough trust that you get more assignments. Oh, he's the guy who actually takes care of stuff. So I, that's me, though. I don't know that that's, that's generally that way. Do you guys, I mean, where, where do you see your path? Where do, you, where do you think you need to go in order to move? It, do you want to move up and be one of the questions? And, <laughs> and where is that path? Yeah, I think that one of the ways, I don't know if this is directly related to like moving up as you say, in a career path, but I think one of the ways that I create influence and power for myself in my job is that people know that I'm here to help them and give them the images they need, and if I can't do exactly what they're asking for, I will come up with some alternate, and like I'm saying, like I'm not a door, I'm like a window, to, I don't know, whichever the, <laughs> whatever the metaphor is, but the idea is that like, I'll help you, you help me. Isn't that way better? And I think that that, that in gen, that, endears you to a lot of different people. And I can't think that endearing yourself to more people in more positions of authority would be bad for your career. Yeah, one of the things Cy Wakeman writes about is assume noble intent. And it's just a catchphrase, right? But I think there's a, there's a way, you, if you can demonstrate in your workplace that even when people come to you and say, you idiot, you screwed everything up for me, 
If you have the psychological confidence to be like, I know I didn't screw anything up for you, and I'm here to help you. So instead of saying, I didn't screw anything up, it's your problem, right? The idea is to be like, tell me what's going on. Talk to me. Tell me more. How and maybe I, it's not as help? big a problem as they think, you know? Generally. Like, yeah. Generally. And they've usually made up some weird story around it. So I, it's, it's, Cy Wakeman says, like, well, hang on a second. What do we know for sure? Those people in accounting, they never get their reports in on time. And they went, like, hang on a second. What do we know for sure? And Joe emailed me and asked for, you know, like, sometimes you can just diffuse it and demonstrate that you have this sort of emotional maturity not to jump in the pool with everyone else and start whining about how awful everything is. It would be like, what do we know for sure? How, how can we help? Yeah, yeah, very much so, yeah. When you're meeting, as you said, everyone comes and works at a museum because they, they buy into the vision. How do you meet people when the vision that they are working towards is different? <laughs> <laughs> But they're passionate off in God knows how many directions, right? Yeah, that, I realize that that could be an issue. <laughs> the question is an interesting one. So is there a vision for your organization? Is it clearly stated? So uh, you kind of have your answer already in a way, right? Like, I, I think... I think your organization needs to get together and develop a vision. And if the vision is either unclear or people don't know it or it's not important enough to care about, then everyone needs to participate and need to go through a facilitated session and, and come up with a really great vision statement that's inspirational. That, without that, what's your North Star? Where do you want to be? Tick, 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 tick. Well, maybe one more question. I, I realize we don't want to be between you and a beer. Interesting. I've never thought of it from that perspective. You guys? We have more time, do we? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think it's actually a really positive thing that if, if we agree as an industry in a field that we do have time to, for the slow change, I think that's a, an alternate session happening right now, um, that to embrace that slow change and to recognize that not everything has to happen overnight, and that's true of an agile transformation, it's true of any sort of leadership model, that this is gonna take time, mm -hmm. and to do the long, slow, hard work of it is really valuable. And you know, my grandpa, <laughs> who came to this country on a boat by himself when he's 11 years old, used to say to me when I would whine and complain, <laughs> and he would say, because it's hard has nothing to do with whether or not you do it. You have to decide if it's right. Thank you for coming to this session. Enjoy the rest of the conference.